very familiar words. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Hear what the Spirit is saying. The fruit of the Spirit is love. The Word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Barb. Um, since we have communion this morning and the table is set, is it okay if I come a little closer to you down in front of it instead of preaching behind it? Is that all right with you if I do that? All right. As long as I have your permission, I'll do that so you can see me because I kind of get lost back there because I'm short. It's not my fault. I was born that way. The other day, I went on the FDA website. How many of you have ever been on the Food and Drug Administration website on purpose? <laughs> I went on there to look and assess the eating habits and the dietary needs of the Cyberling household. Um, and I found one thing out, and you will probably discover this too. You should be eating more fruit. Oh, I forgot to tell you something. I'm sorry. Inside your bulletin, you have notes. If they're helpful to you, use them. If they're not helpful to you, recycle them. Okay? So that's your first fill in the blank. You should be eating more fruits. We should be eating more fruits. If I asked you how many cups a day of fruit should be eating, how many of you think one cup of fruit? How many of you think two cups of fruit? How many of you think three cups of fruit? Well, the correct answer is B, two cups of fruit. If you're an adult, you should be eating two cups of fruit a day, and that's three to five servings of fruit. How many of you think that sounds like a lot of fruit to you? We'll all be fruity till we eat three to five cups of fruit um, a day. But the reality of this, eating healthy is a hard choice. I mean, how many of you make bad choices when it comes to what you eat? The reality of it is we convince ourselves and we tell ourselves, I have a young Jane Fonda or Arnold Schwarzenegger inside of me. Isn't that what we tell ourselves? I'm going to eat right. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to do the healthy life. How many of you have ever had this conversation with yourself? It usually happens about the 1st of January every year. Okay. And, and what we say is inside there's this like young, healthy, vibrant person just trying to get out. If I just make healthy food choices, that, that, that's, what, that's what I'm going to be like. I'll have my own step aerobics thing. Uh, it'll be great. How many of you have ever done that? That's what we think our lives are like. But in reality... Uh, we all have a cookie monster inside of us. That's what really is going on inside of us. Um, how many of you remember Sesame Street when your kids were little or growing up? Remember how every skit now, they've done a shift with Cookie Monster. He now loves fruits and vegetables. It's fine. I, it's not the Cookie Monster I grew up with, but it's probably a better role model for kids. But when I was growing up, every skit, Every spoof with the cookie monster ended how? Me want cookie, right? And then he'd like eat the letter R or the number five or something like that. How many of you remember that cookie monster? Yeah, that's the one I'm familiar with. And I've discovered that I have a cookie monster inside of me. And so now I ask you a very, very difficult question. What's your diet like? What is your diet like? Here's some fruit for thought. How many fruits have you eaten today? 
Cookies with jam in the middle do not count as a serving size of fruit. Nor do bagels with blueberry spread or strawberry jam on toast. So how many of you are tied with me with zero fruits this morning? I have a confession to make. That's how many I've had today, zero fruits. And then what are some ways you could be eating more fruits? I mean, breakfast is a great time to have a banana over your cereal. Do I need to be further away on this? Um, it's a, um, maybe instead of reaching for a cookie, we could reach for some fruit. How many of you think that would be a good way to get more fruits? A lot of you serve bread with your meals at dinner time. That's a great time to substitute uh, starch with some fresh pineapple or some sliced apples or some bananas. There's lots of great ways that you can eat more fruit. Well, today we start a sermon series on fruit, but we're not going to be talking about eating fruit. We're going to be talking about producing more fruit. Um, God's recommendations are for the greatest spiritual benefit. And if he says, if you're going to be in the Spirit, you should be producing fruit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But here's the rub. Spiritually speaking, we all have a cookie monster inside of us, don't we? And spiritual health, just like eating more fruits and eating more vegetables is a hard choice, spiritual health, is a hard choice. Do you know how I know this? I know this by looking closely at the word. If you look up our scripture lesson today, what is the first word in that scripture lesson? It's but. But, no, not that kind, the other kind. <laughs> but infers that there was something else going on before we became Christians besides love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He says, but this is what you should be having. That means that's not what was going on before the Holy Spirit came to live and dwell inside of us. And I don't know about you, but I know there are times in my Christian life where those fruits aren't readily obvious. Now, we're going to be, so now the question is, so how do we get the fruit of the Spirit? How do we get better at producing fruit? And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to study the fruits. We're going to find out what it is exactly that God expects of us. Um, what God wants for you and has for you. And then we're going to talk about making long-term choices in a short-term world. How many of you are aware that we live in a short-term world? I don't know about you, but my microwave doesn't cook fast enough. Do any of you have that problem at home? You're standing outside the microwave and you're like, cook faster. Remember, how many of you remember the days when if you wanted to heat up leftovers, you had to get out the pots and the pans and heat it up on the stove and everything was just like a little drier than it was the first time around before microwaves? But now we live in a society where you just add water to everything, right? Just add water, put it in the microwave, you've got food, you know? Uh, we have a society of instant gratification you don't have to save up money to buy things anymore like you used to. What do you do? You get a what? You get a loan. That's what the bank's for, right? So I don't have to save my money. I can have it now. I don't have to wait long term. But the fruit of the Spirit sometimes asks for long term, long term choices in this world. The fruit of the Spirit is actually singular. How many of you thought that there were like fruits of the Spirit and that there were nine fruits of the Spirit? That's wrong. In the Greek, and actually properly translated into the English, there is only one Spirit. Does that make sense? And there's only one fruit. And the characterizations of that fruit are those nine things, but there's only one fruit and there's only one Spirit. Um, and that list is, can you read them off the screen and memorize them? Because I want us to memorize these as we go through. So read them with me. They're listed there. Love, joy, peace, 
patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I, I remember it, um, love, joy, peace are the first three, and then packaged, abbreviated, PKG, figs without the I, FGS. So um, I know that's kind of lame that I have to remember them that way, but that's how I remember them. And maybe I'll help you remember them today. So here's some fruit, more fruit for thought. What is the fruit of the Spirit to you? What is it? And then where in your life do you need more fruit of the Spirit? Maybe in your marriage, maybe in your family, your relationship with your kids or your parents, maybe in your church, maybe in your workplace. Maybe they could all benefit from a little more fruit of the Spirit. We're going to head in right away in this sermon series with the fruit, first fruit, which is what? Love. Um, there's a lot of talk about love in the Bible. How many of you notice that? The Bible just talks about love over and over and over and over again. Why does the Bible do that? The Bible does that because God is what? Love. Um, the most famous verse about love was our call to worship. And how many of you have been to a wedding lately? Probably if you've been to a wedding and if the preacher preached anything, he preached on 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient. I, I can stop right there, right? Okay, because that's enough for me to work on. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. But I love how 1 Corinthians 13 starts out in the very first verse. Paul says, now let me show you the most excellent way. Not the eh, eh way, okay? Not the good enough way. Not the so-so way. Not even the excellent way, but the what? The most excellent way. I would like the most excellent marriage, wouldn't you? I would like the most excellent family. How many of you want that? I would like to have and be pastor of the most excellent church. I would like to work at the most excellent place. I would like to have the most excellent friends. I would like to have the most excellent boss, wouldn't you? Well, according to this scripture, Paul shows us the most excellent way, and it is what? Love. And he is right. Another verse on love that we learned is what? Everybody knows it. Everybody say, John, finish it, 316. And I always like to add 17 on there. Uh, for God so loved the world. How many of you, this was the first Bible verse you ever learned? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I never knew what begotten meant until I grew up. That whosoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then it goes on to say that God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I think this verse and the reason that we teach young children, the reason it was the first for most of us, is because um, it shows the heart of God. God so what? Loved. God is love. Are you ready for some bad news? I only preach one sermon. We only pre staff parish didn't, they didn't tell staff parish that, did they, during my introduction? I only preach one sermon, and that's on love. I preach about how God loves us. I preach about what God's love looks like. I preach about how, because God loves us, he calls us to love others. I preach about what that looks like. Um, I preach about all kinds of aspects of love. Forgiving because we love, loving the unlovable, loving our spouse, loving our kids, loving our jobs. I preach about all aspects of love, but my sermon is always, always, always about only one thing, and that is love. If you don't like love, you're not going to like my sermons. I'm warning you right now, okay? And I preach about love because I believe love is the essence of the heart of God. Amen? Amen. It's also the reason that Jesus came to your earth. 
God didn't just love the world. He, did so, he loved the world and you and me so much that he did something about it. He did what according to John 3, 16? He sent his only son into the world. If God didn't love us, he wouldn't have sent Jesus. That's just kind of the bottom line. He wasn't going to make that kind of sacrifice for us. The only reason we sacrifice is because we love. Amen? Parents, do you know that? Yes, you know that, right? We sacrifice because we love. And God gave Jesus as a sacrifice to show us how to live and then ultimately to die for our sins. And that is why Jesus came to the earth, because God what? Loves us. That's right. And then it's also the evidence of the Spirit, which brings us back today. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Here's some, our final piece of fruit for thought. Do you feel and believe you are loved by God? Well, that was kind of lame. Do you feel and believe you're loved by God? Good. And then if you are loved by God, how do you share God's love with others? God didn't love us so we could sit in a cloistered place and and just keep that love all to ourselves god gave us love to fill us and overflow into the world so that the world would be loved as god so loved the world here's the thing though i often forget how much how deeply and how richly god loves me how many of you forget that sometimes? I mean, I want the first thought when I wake up in the morning to be about God's love. And when I lay my pillow on my head on my pillow at night, I want my last thought to be about God's love. And I want every thought in between to be about that. But I fail sometimes. I mean, come on, how many of you go to the grocery store and you have, you're going for milk? So you get to the store, and then you get home, and you have Funyuns, some butter, and a Coca-Cola. Why did you go to the store for milk? How could you be so stupid? Dummy. I'm talking about myself, honey. How could I be so stupid? Ah, maybe you do that to yourselves. Call yourselves names you would never call anyone else. Guess what I forgot? I forgot God loves me. I think Jesus died on the cross for me because he thought I was stupid and didn't know how to grocery shop. No. <laughs> but we do it. We forget how loved we are by God. And here's another thing. Every time I find myself sinning, it's because I've forgotten how deeply God loves me. Gossip, what's that all about? Well, I'll tell you right now what it's all about. It's about forgetting how much God loves us because you know what? Sometimes my life starts spinning out of control and I feel like, oh, I've got to control this situation. So I say something to someone hoping to influence their thoughts hoping to influence their views, hoping to change the situation in my favor. Well, if I know God loves me, if I know God is in control, and that God, because he loves me, gives me good things, guess what? I don't need to say anything to anybody because I trust God with that situation because I know how much he loves me. What about arguing with our spouses. Not that anyone does that. <laughs> no one does that here because we're all good church folk. But, but uh, maybe somewhere out there, someone gets in a disagreement with their spouse, right? Um, why? How does that happen? Why on earth does that happen, Pastor Kim? I'll tell you why. Because we have broken pieces inside of us 
that were maybe broken in our childhood, that were perhaps broken in our adulthood, that are part of maybe a traumatic situation that's happened in our lives. And sometimes we need someone to heal those broken places in my life. Maybe as a young child, your parents didn't encourage you as much as you needed encouraged. So we get married and we guard our spouse with this need to be encouraged. And so we do something and our spouse doesn't encourage us. How dare they? And so when we're like, why, what, what's your problem? Why aren't you giving me what I need? Because spouses are supposed to read our brains and our minds. Somehow they're just supposed to know what we need. And that happen when you get married. We get mad at them and we demand that they approve of us. We demand that they heal that broken part in our lives. It's very, very quickly and early on in our marriage that we discover our spouses are human. They're not gods. They were never intended to fill that place in our heart and in our lives. And that we have maybe elevated them to a place where they don't belong. And that we go to our spouses for, for fulfillment within us that only God can fill in us. Only God can heal within us. So we end up in a fight because we forget that what? God loves us. So brothers and sisters, don't ever forget how deeply you are loved by God. Here's the thing about sin. I've got some good news and bad news about sin. I like the bad news first. Anybody out there want to get the bad news out of the way? Here's the bad news. You are a sinful being. I am a sinful being. I do it early and often, every day, okay? God knows every sin you've ever committed. Every mean word that's ever left your mouth. Any malicious act you've ever done. Any cruel thought you've ever had. God knows knows it. I don't know about you, but that makes me feel a little embarrassed and ashamed. But embarrassment and shame are tools of Satan. Amen? And when it comes to coming before Jesus, he doesn't want us to be embarrassed or ashamed. He already knows you're not telling him anything new when we confess to him. Okay? Okay? But this is the good news about our sin and our humanness and the cookie monster living inside of us. God knows everything you've ever done, where you've been, who you've been with. And guess what? He loves you anyway. There's nothing you can do that will ever separate yourself from the love of Christ. There's nothing he won't forgive. There's nothing that he won't love you through. Today, we celebrate Holy Communion. And this is a sacred meal that represents that God not only knows our sin, but God forgives us and loves us anyway. In that spirit, let us now go to God in silent confession of our sins to him. Perfect and holy God, we confess to you this day that we are sinful beings. We admit that it is not always love that lies in our hearts, but insecurity and jealousy and sometimes anger and hate and all kinds of things that we just even hate to confess to you, Lord. But you see it all. And this day we ask your forgiveness. We ask you to forgive us for the things we've done and the things, Lord, that you have called us to that we have left undone. Let this day, Lord, be a new day, a day of opportunity 
so that through your love we may serve you and serve others. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear the good news. It is by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that you and I are forgiven. Amen. This morning, we're going to be taking communion. You need not be a member of this church or the United Methodist Church to partake in communion. All that's necessary is that you seek to have a loving relationship with your creator, God. This morning, we're going to be taking communion a little differently than maybe some of you are accustomed to. We'll be taking communion in the pews. And um, I've chosen to do communion this way because... Part of God's love um, is not just letting God love you, but it's sharing God with others. And so we're going to be serving each other this morning. And I thought this would be a wonderful act of love to serve communion to each other. The ushers are going to pass the trays of bread. You can take the tray, and I want you to look at the person sitting next to you and say to them, this is the body of Christ. And then if you like, you may take the sacrament to your comfort. If you want to wait to the end, um, when everyone receives and you want to take it with a spouse or someone at the end, you're welcome to do that. Either is acceptable. And then we'll have the little cups of grape juice. And as we pass that, say to the person that you're serving, this is the body or this is the blood of Christ. Um, So at this point in time, I would like to invite the ushers forward to distribute Holy Communion. We'll be serving from both the front and the back of the church this morning.